Well, good evening, friends. I'd like to welcome all of you to this very special evening and thank you for your support of this university effort. We are now celebrating our centennial and literally laying a second cornerstone. But there is no building block which is more important than bringing distinguished persons to this campus and to this city to address issues of mutual concern. And that's why tonight we are so delighted in our guest. I welcome you and I thank you for supporting this effort of the university to serve this community. And now I would simply like to introduce Mrs. Sandra Myers, who is a friend of the arts, a friend of the University of Scranton, and a servant of the Commonwealth. Sandra Myers. Thank you, Father Panuska, and welcome to all of you. In light of the 200th anniversary of the Constitution and the 100th anniversary of this university, a five-year celebration may seem pale. But as we mark the fifth year of the Judaic Studies program at this Jesuit university with a lecture by the 1986 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, I cannot consider it a minor occasion. In fact, it is a moment which evokes in me a deeper appreciation of that precious document under whose rule and guidance we live together in freedom, and of this Catholic institution, which has reached beyond its own religious boundaries to recognize the importance of Judaism in its own tradition and the need for deeper understanding among all peoples. Five years ago, the Judaic Studies program began with a lecture by Elie Wiesel. And we knew then that we wanted this hero for our time to return as soon as possible to share with us his painful memories of the past and his persistent hopes for the future. In his very being, Elie Wiesel stands for, as he works every moment of his life for, the future of humankind. Emerging from the darkest shadows of the Holocaust, a survivor of the most brutal, cynical, and insane conspiracy against humanity, he has become an insistent and eloquent voice for life. Through his novels, stories, and essays, his teaching, and his public advocacy of human rights and justice for all people, he lifts our spirits and breathes life into our dreams for a better world. He is a hero for our time because he has seen the darkness, he has seen human cruelty in its essence, yet he instructs us in hope. He ignites our conscience, sparks our imagination, awakens our spirit in the name of life. He rallies us to action, insists that by remembering, understanding, and assuming responsibility, we can choose a more humane future. Even as his fellow Nobel Peace Laureate, Martin Luther King, had a dream, so Elie Wiesel has a dream of the possibility for a better world, a world which we must construct as we travel on that narrow road between the past and the future. This renowned author, inspired teacher, winner of countless awards and honorary degrees, Nobel laureate, survivor, and builder, does great honor to this university and to all of us by instructing us tonight in his wisdom, his courage, and his hope. It is with profound respect and affection that I present Elie Wiesel. My dear Sandra, Mr. President, distinguished members of the faculty, students, friends, it is indeed a meaningful moment for me to come back to this place. I've been here five years ago, and at that time I tried to remember that I spoke about the Bible, about Talmud, about the universality of the Jewish lesson. 
what I tried to say then, I still repeat now, that unless Jews and Christians and Muslims and Buddhists and people who are secular or not, who belong to any tradition, to any ethnic community, unless all of us believe that we are all children of the same father, unless we believe so, there is no hope for our humanity to survive in a world that is cynical and cold and so disheartening. But I do believe that when we look at our text, when we scrutinize a tradition that has been handed down to us by generations of scholars and disciples, when we see that the words that Moses heard at Sinai, the words that Rabbi Akiba studied in Jerusalem, that those very words still mean something to us, that these are the words that nourish our own, that feed our own, that justify our own. And therefore, when we study together, I think hope is not only possible, it is a certainty. There is a Talmudic law which is on the surface cruel. It says, Golim Talmud, if a disciple is condemned to banishment, Golim Rabo Imo, his or her teacher must be banished together with the disciple. Now, as a teacher, I'm afraid. Why should I be responsible for my students' activities? Am I, really, am I really to be banished because one of my students has done something wrong? But what is the reason for this law? One, I am responsible. If the student, after having studied with me one semester, or with you, one semester, or two, or four, if that student can do something so serious as to warrant banishment, that it's our fault. But even more important is that the student therefore becomes responsible for the teacher. Whenever the student does something, the student will know that he or she is responsible for my security, for my freedom, and yours as well. So you see, study is what reconciles the fate of the teacher and the fate of the student. So I am celebrating study. And this is why I am so pleased to come back to be together with, with Sandra and her friends and all of you to celebrate study together, especially in this case to celebrate Jewish studies. What better place could there be for a Jewish studies program than a Jesuit university? <laughs> <laughs> Does it mean that once you practice reconciliation, I still have to speak about it? Right. Why not? Let me start with a story, a Hasidic story. One cannot uh, begin anything without a Hasidic story, and this one is meaningful. There was a very great master, humble, simple. His name was Rabbi Zusia. He was the simpleton of the Hasidic legend. He was so humble that he never really knew that he was a master. And legend has it that one day he took the train and he went from one town to another. In the same compartment, there was a man who was very wealthy and arrogant. And uh, he was so arrogant that he was arrogant every minute. The poor Rabbi Zusia, all he had was a little book, the Psalms, and he was repeating Psalms hour after hour. And he was always disturbed, annoyed, almost offended by this man who was his neighbor in the compartment. Then they arrived into the next town, and there were hundreds of people waiting for the Hasidic master. When the other man saw what he had done, he came running to his inn, and he said, Rabbi, Rabbi, forgive me. Please forgive me. I didn't know who you were. Forgive me. And the Rabbi said, no, I will not forgive you. He said, I will give you half of what I possess. And he possessed a lot. Rabbi Zuzia said, no, I still will not forgive you. I will give you all I have. Still, said Rabbi Zuzia, I will not forgive you. So this man went to Rabbi Zuzia's brother, who was a very, very great tzaddik, a just man. And 
the founder of a school, Rabbi Elimelech of Lizensk. He said, Rabbi, your brother is heartless. Your brother is cruel. He refuses to forgive me. And Rabbi Elimelech said, I cannot believe that. My brother, who is so nice and so kind to anyone, so he went to see his brother. He said, Zuzia, what do I hear? Is it true? He said, yes. You don't forgive this Jew who was with you on the train? No, I cannot forgive him. But why not? He said, because he didn't insult me. What do you mean? He said, look, he didn't know who I was. He saw a poor man. He thought it's a beggar. So he insulted the beggar. Can I forgive him? Let him go and ask forgiveness from all the beggars in the land. They, the anonymous ones, they should forgive him. Now, if reconciliation means forgiveness as well, we have a problem. Who am I to forgive? I, at best, could forgive for something that has been done to me personally. But that doesn't really matter to me that much. But can I forgive in the name of someone else? Has anyone authorized me to forgive? Now, if we speak about reconciliation in the broader sense, then of course we must ask the question, reconciliation with whom? With those who are our neighbors? With those who are our adversaries? With those who are our opponents? With those who hate us? Still, even today, there are a minority, of course, but they still exist, and they are vocal. Should we reconcile ourselves with evil? Is that possible? Is it desirable? All of us believe that evil has to be fought. It has to be disarmed. And reconciliation with evil means acceptance of evil. Reconciliation with evil means to lend strength to evil. It means to justify evil and to become ultimately an accomplice of evil. We believe, you Christians and I as a Jew, we believe that wherever evil raises its head, we must first of all unmask it, identify it, name it, and fight it. And if possible, fight it together. For evil has the same effect on us as it has on you. Evil is evil. Those who ever believed that it was possible to attack only one group and leave the others alone, it's not so. When one group is, let us say, victimized, persecuted, oppressed, all the others are affected. Whatever happens to any human being, we are told in our tradition, has an effect on creation in its totality. The death of a person is a blemish on creation, we are told in Kabbalah, in our mystical, splendid literature of splendor. So therefore, we no longer believe, neither you nor we believe that, that we can live in parallel epochs, and we can follow parallel roads, never to meet or only to meet in conflict. That is finished. For many, many centuries, it was possible for Jewish history and history not to be together. Now we know that whatever occurs within the realm of one community, ethnic or religious, affects the other communities. When the Jewish people suffered, humanity suffered. I think it was Franz Kafka who phrased it as always best. He said, when a Jew is slapped in the face, it is humanity that falls to the ground. And I would say the same thing, therefore, about any victim. When any victim is victimized, it is humanity through that victim that falls to the ground. And if we are not on the side of the victim, then surely we are on the side of the victimizer. So to reconcile ourselves, therefore, with whom? Naturally, the question today is not only applicable to today. 
I always like to go back to the source. And what is the source to me? The same that is to you, the Bible. The Bible is always the source of all study. And surely you must have good teachers, because I, I'm sure this university has good teachers, for it has good students. And you know that an ancient text contains a voice that gives it intensity and melody and riches. And nothing is more beautiful nor richer than the biblical text. So I go back to the Bible. And I'm asking myself, what is the role of reconciliation in the Bible? I must tell you that the results are disappointing. Reconciliation does not fare too well in the Bible. Adam and Eve, I don't even think they were happy before they were born. <laughs> and it is because they, because they were not happy that the serpent could enter the scene as the eternal third party and do all kinds of things that better we shouldn't talk about. So did Adam and Eve reconcile after the sin? Take Cain and Abel. Oh, it's a terrible story. Cain and Abel really knew no reconciliation, and therefore one became the killer or the victim of the other. And I always think about Cain and Abel because it is so applicable to all societies everywhere, especially today. What does Cain, what does Abel teach us? That people could be brothers and yet kill one another. I would rather believe that the lesson is a more human one and therefore a more ethical one that whoever kills, kills one's brother. But they did not find reconciliation as a response to their existence. For later on, or oh, later on we have terrible problems. Uh, take Abraham. Abraham had, as you remember, two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Were they reconciled? Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Were they reconciled? Jacob had 12 sons, Joseph and his brothers. Were they reconciled? And the answer is yes. When? When they went to the funeral of their, of their parents. Which means it takes a funeral to bring people together. Is this a lesson that we need death to have an impact on our behavior? Why shouldn't we know reconciliation in joy and not in despair and not in mourning? So reconciliation there was fleeting and I think it came too late. Reconciliation therefore, I believe, must have an effect on the immediate, although it encompasses the past to its very distant level. What do I mean by that? Reconciliation with the living, yes, it is not easy, surely not for my generation, but it is much more important to reconcile ourselves with the dead, with our ancestors. And that is really the problem. Any student, any human being, is the sum total of thousands and thousands of generations. And we all are a living memory that contains living memories. It is the memory of generations that gives mind what it has, and therefore what it is, and therefore what I am. Memory brings us together, and if not, then we are in danger, for it can set us apart. Now, what is reconciliation and what is memory? I believe that with reconciliation, we should discuss all that it implies. The most important element in reconciliation is not only the desire to reconcile ourselves with those who are not ourselves, but 
the most important component is memory. With memory, reconciliation is possible. For reconciliation enriches and redeems memory. Without memory, reconciliation is unnecessary and therefore impractical and unattainable. If I do not remember what has been done to my ancestors and to me, how should I even envisage that there is a necessity for me, there is a need for me to reconcile my, myself? With whom? Nobody has ever done anything wrong. Without memory, reconciliation is therefore meaningless, lifeless, empty of humanity. Without memory, all endeavors seem futile and sterile. Though convenient for the immediate moment, it makes things simpler. Reconciliation without memory is doomed to fail and to betray those who have placed exaggerated but much needed hopes in it. Memory means culture, education, art, spiritual experiments, religious quest for truth, social quest for justice. Without memory, mankind would face a future both naked and impoverished. Could anyone conceive of Judaism without the memory of Sinai and the temple in Jerusalem? Or of Christianity without the memory of Nazareth and Bethlehem? Or of Islam without the memory of Medina and Mecca? Could anyone speak of art without the memory of Michelangelo or Goya or Caravaggio? or of theater without Racine, Goethe, and Shakespeare. It is what we bring to the future that lends memory strength and lends future a vision. And what do we bring to it if not what we have? And what runs through our very being, the lifeline of generations? Memory aims at helping both the past and the future. Memory is their point of reconciliation. And that is why in Hasidic language, memory is so intrinsically linked to redemption. Without memory, there is no redemption. And there is redemption in memory. It is within memory that past and present meet and nourish one another. How did the poet put it? Memory is man's real possession. In nothing else is he or she rich. In nothing else is he or she poor. Memory is man's keyword or password to history and civilization. It restores the absence into the presence, the dead to the living. And the more the dead are present, the more their death troubles and pains the living. Is memory made of pain alone? No, it transcends pain. It allows the living to be in closer touch with the dead of yesterday or yesteryear or hundreds of generations ago. Memory offers a framework for people to seek reconciliation with the dead and the living. A reconciliation without bitterness, anger or resentment. Reconciliation, of course, is necessary, even essential for humanity to progress and survive. A society that does not make peace with its dead is inevitably doomed to make war with the living. And therefore, it will forever remain perturbed, traumatized, poisoned. And that applies to all of us and surely to our generation, which is so special for what we have inherited from the previous generation is a unique amount of suffering, a unique amount of tears and of mute anger. If there exists a people which almost in self-defense has since the very beginning of its appearance on the stage of history 
always sought reconciliation with its surrounding neighbors. I think it is the Jewish people. Tormented, persecuted, oppressed, humiliated by a multitude of groups for a multitude of reasons, Jews had to reconcile themselves to hostile surroundings, lest they, we, be crushed. Today, it is even more true than ever. There never has been hate between Jews and their deadly enemies. Of course, there were exceptions. There still are. Some Jews claim even now that they must hate Germany and the Germans, but I believe that they constitute a minority. During the war, there were many victims who urged survivors, potential survivors, to avenge their dead, and their wish remained unfulfilled. We simply do not believe in bloodshed for the sake of bloodshed, for we do not believe in hate as a response to persecution and bloodshed. Hate distorts memory just as it distorts everything else, for hate negates reconciliation. But we do believe in memory, in memory alone. If it is not distorted, mutilated, embellished, or cheapened, it could become a powerful instrument of reconciliation and peace. Memory would then call for hope. When men and women, strangers or former foes, who believe in different traditions, when they offer their memories to one another, they may evoke a past filled with fear and fire, but they also create a future illuminated and justified by joy. To remember war is therefore the most effective means to eliminate war. The memory of injustice is already a quest for justice. It is wrong to believe that memory could divide people. The opposite is true. In discovering that all memories are rooted in the same one, that their source is the same, people would see one another as allies for the same cause. Or at least we would know that the fate may be the same for all of us, for we all live in the same time and we all are seen by the same God in heaven. So where is reconciliation in all that? Does it mean that today we should reconcile ourselves with, let us say, those who try to kill us? Strange, but this is the question that has been offered to us for years and years by many, many people. How long will it take, they ask us, for you to forgive what the Germans have done? How long will it take you to forget what so many enemies have done? Strange, but no other people is being asked that question. After all, during the Second World War, the German army has occupied many lands. It has occupied Russia and Poland, and Holland, and France, and Norway, and on and on and on. And yet those nations are not being asked, why don't you forgive? It is only the Jewish people that is being asked again and again, why don't you forgive? But I must tell you with some sadness that we have been asked by whom? We have been asked by people who should know better. Has anyone in Germany, has the German nation ever asked the Jewish people, please forgive us? I can tell you I am proud of our nation that a few weeks ago, the Congress, Senate and the House have adopted a bill simply asking the Japanese to forgive us for what we have done to them, the Nisais, in, in 1941. And I find it beautiful. 
Here is a nation proud of its tradition, proud of its generous memory, to know that there was a time when we were wrong. And therefore, please, forgive us. Oh, we are giving money to, the Congress has voted money, as the Germans have given money to Israel. But that's not enough. We need words. Words live longer than money. And the Wall Street proves it. <laughs> it is words that we need, and the words have not come forth. I must also tell you, I would like to think that soon Congress in its entirety will also adopt a law, a bill, asking the Indians to forgive them. Why not? After all, we have done terrible things to the Indians here, and I think it would be proper, it would be nice, it would be the nice thing to do, and say, please forgive us. We have done it, we are sorry, but we are sorry in recognizing that we are responsible for what has been done in our history. I think we are improving the image of ourselves in our own eyes, and surely in the eyes of our children. For the name of the secret is responsibility. Are we responsible for what happened in the past? Yes, we are. Not legally, but humanly. Therefore, the way we speak of the past is actually the way we address the present. Surely you would know the way the Bible, again the Bible, affects our lives to this very day. I think of it because uh, we are celebrating the Constitution and again it's a great document, of course it's a great document. And, and I hear, I heard on the television and in, on the newspapers, everybody praising the Constitution, and rightfully so, for being the oldest living document which still governs our lives today. Well, there I have a problem. It is not the oldest, because the Bible is a little bit older. And the Bible is still governing our lives today. Whether you are totally religious or not, it doesn't matter. It matters, maybe, but I am not God's policeman here to tell you that. But the fact is that it places such an emphasis with whatever moral integrity it conjures on our life, on our behavior, on our responses, that we cannot ignore it. And in the Bible there are things that are very, very beautiful. Again an example, we are proud of of what we did a hundred years ago or so, when we went to civil war because of the slaves. After all, great, it's beautiful, that we went to war because we, against ourselves, because we believe that slavery is wrong. Now, 3,500 years ago, just read the Bible. The first law that was given to the children of Israel and therefore through them to all of us, the first law is against slavery. You start the Eile HaMishpatim, these are the laws, says God to Moses, that you shall give to the people. The first one is don't accept slavery. No one should own slaves. Any psychologist will tell you here that that must have come as a shock to the people. Any nouveau riche wants to show off his or her riches, his wealth. They behave, they dress differently, they have nicer cars. They want to show they are no longer poor. Any liberated slave in the past, the first thing that he or she would do is to acquire slaves, to show I am no longer a slave. And here comes Moses in the name of God and says to a nation that weeks before has been a nation of slaves, no slaves. I am surprised they didn't stone him right there. Not only is a person not supposed to own slaves, a person cannot be a slave. The slave is to be punished if the slave chooses to remain a slave. Because I am free. As a human being, I am sovereign. But I am not free to give up my freedom. Now this is a lesson 
this is a lesson that we have inherited from the past and which we take as part of our daily life. If not, our life is not complete. There are so many lessons about the sanctity of life, about the sanctity of life in the other, that I must see anyone confronting me, anyone walking with me as the only person in the world for whom the world was created. I have no right to hurt anyone, for then I injure God himself. I have surely no right to humiliate anyone, for humiliation means killing. In our law, humiliating a person means to destroy that person. The same punishment applies to both. So I believe, therefore, that we are responsible for the past. I get up every morning and I have the right and the possibility to choose myself freely as this, a son of the Jewish people. Naturally, it's not me. I, I happen to be born to a certain family in a certain time, to a certain people. Yes, so were you. But every day we can make that choice. And every day we prove with our acts, with our deeds, whether we mean it, whether the choice is a true choice. And if I mean it, then I reconcile myself with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, or in your case, with Jesus. Which brings me, of course, to the present in a very concrete context. What does reconciliation with memory mean? Does it mean that we all become one? Absolutely not. Does it mean that when I came into this university, this great, really this great and marvelous Jesuit university, that when I came here, I left my memories at the door? I hope you don't want me to do that. Once upon a time, your ancestors did want that when they met my ancestors. There were times in the medieval epoch, whenever a Jew and a Christian were to have a debate, at that time they called it a disputation, the objective was to convert the Jew. When a Jew entered a cathedral, he, it was only for one purpose, because those who invited him there meant to convert him. This is no longer the case. We have made progress. And now you Christians realize the value of having Jews as Jews. You need us as Jews. You don't need more Christians. You have 850 million. <laughs> but you need us as Jews, just as we need you as Christians. And I believe that if I am a better Jew, you will be better Christians. And that is true, again, I really believe in it. It's true of all the people in the world. We could prove that, that there is equality among traditions, that we all may try to prove ourselves to be better, but that everyone has the right to say, I need to be better. Why not? Today, therefore, what I try to do is to prove to myself that in order for me to be of any value, not only to my people, which of course, to me, I must tell you, is predominant. A traumatized person the way I am, of course, to me, the Jewish people is my universe. But it is not exclusive. I think that we live today in an age where we can be more generous. But I, my heart is big enough to include not only the Jewish people who need help, but all people who need help. The age of communication today is such that we know instantly whenever tragedy strikes anywhere. If Ethiopia once more threatens to become a landscape of death and starvation, we know about it. And the fact is, we already know about it, because we heard it on radio and we saw it on television yesterday and today. And there is no excuse for me as a Jew not to be involved in it, nor is it for you not to be involved in it. 
Does it mean, therefore, that I have to live in my own ghetto, in my own portable ghetto? Not at all. I believe that the more Jewish the Jew, the more universal the Jew. The more Jewish the Jew, the more universal the lesson that I receive and that I share. And in order for me to give, I must have. In order for me to have, I must be. And the same could be said by a Christian or a Muslim or a Buddhist or a secular agnostic. It is the respect for the person that moves me to say that I believe in reconciliation, meaning in conciliation with all those who are not like me. Strangely enough, this lesson, a lesson of simplicity and humanity in history, has become now a necessity for all of us. We must believe in it, because the planet has shrunk. We live in constraint. Never before did we realize how small the planet is. And never before have we realized how vulnerable our destiny has become. Just think about it. 30 years ago, a computer would take up probably half of this hall. Today, you have computers in a briefcase. If this is true of computers, why couldn't it be true of nuclear weapons? Which means by the year 2000, any terrorist may get hold of a small miniature nuclear weapon. Just think of Khomeini with nuclear weapons. Think of Gaddafi with nuclear weapons, small nuclear weapons. And surely you must know that. If not, you must force yourself to know that, that there is nonsense in the belief that a limited nuclear war is possible. Once nuclear weapons are used, all of them will be used. In 1945, all the nuclear weapons that existed, two bombs, were used. And there is a discussion whether the first one was needed or not, but the second one surely was not needed against Nagasaki. But there is something, there is a curse, there is a malediction in the nuclear weapon that once they are there, they are there to be used. A French philosopher, I think it was Bachelard, who said, we have succeeded in stealing the fire from heaven and we live to regret it. And of course, he spoke of the nuclear fire. A few years ago, President François Mitterrand whom I had known from before he was president. You know, my relations with presidents are not always good. <laughs> and before he was president, we, we became good friends. And when he came on a state visit to the, to the United States, he, I saw him in Paris. He said, I want to come and visit you. And that, I said, thank you, but this is the last thing I want. Uh, he had no idea what it meant in America for a president to come to visit a private home. You know, hundreds of security people. And what they are doing, they stop traffic in the street. And they have a place, they place policemen on the roof. And, and, and what don't they do? And, and they, you know, I, I thought all my neighbors will hate me. <laughs> they wouldn't be able to enter the, with the car in the street. The elevators will be blocked. What do I need it for? So I said, you know, Mr. President, it's really much better if I come to see you in the hotel. And Oh, no, no, what do you mean, he said. Uh, when you come to Paris, you come to visit me. Why shouldn't I come and visit you? You know, logic, I, I am disarmed. When it comes to logic, what can I say? I could, I could argue mystically, but he's not a mystic. <laughs> uh, so before he came, 24 hours before, the president of IT&T called. You know, I, I, I thought IT&T, or the, now it's called AT&T, is a kind of myth. I never knew it existed. I thought it's a kind of uh, invention, a verbal invention, good for television, something, you know. And there was really a company called IT&T. And there was a president. And he called up, he said, I got the instructions to install a special line in your home. I said, what special line? You know, but what it appears is the following. Since France is a nuclear power, the French president, being the commander-in-chief of the nuclear army, must constantly be in touch with a secure line to his nuclear army in France that, as you say in Yiddish, maybe God forbid, you know, 
God forbid that the Russians should attack uh, France, he could give the order retaliate. So in came, you know, the, the IT&T people, they installed the line and that special telephone, and there came a general or an admiral, I don't know the difference between, between officers now. And uh, he had to keep that line. So to make it look ridiculous, I placed the telephone in, in the room of my son, who was then, I think, seven or eight, among the other toys. You know, <laughs> I had so many toys there, one more. <coughs> and when the president came next day, I, of course, took him to the telephone. I said, Mr. President, I want you to know something. If this telephone rings, I pick it up, and I will say, wrong number. <laughs> I, I, I didn't want the Third World War to begin in my room, in my apartment. <laughs> I don't want the Third World War to begin anywhere. For I believe that what we have learned now is we are united in fear. Are we united in hope as well? Can we be reconciled in hope as some nations and some groups are reconciled under terror. I believe, of course, it is possible, provided we all respect the identity, the cultural or religious heritage of the other, provided we realize that the sum of all human beings is the same as the sum of one human being. If God is in one, he is in all. And I would like to remove the word if and replace it with the word when. Since God is, he is everywhere. And if God is everywhere, we have no right to humiliate him in anyone. Now, I realize now that I am on a dangerous ground because I speak of God uh, in, in, in masculine Tense. God, he, I know that some feminists would object to that. I am ready to change uh, an, any, any word for it. I had once a problem with it about the Messiah. I believe in the Messiah. I'm a Jew and I pray every day. I believe in the coming of the Messiah. This is a principle that was announced and codified by Maimonides. And uh, there is a marvelous story, a true one. Years and years ago, not that many years, maybe five or six years ago, <coughs> the Lubavitcher Hasidim, the Lubavitcher is a Hasidic group in Brooklyn, and they believe in education, and they send their own messengers to very small places, and they do marvelous work, because they go to places where nobody else is going. And many young people would be lost to cults or to drugs if it were not for this group that believes in education and takes them in. They also have what they call mitzvah mobiles. They take a truck and they prevail upon passers-by to obey the commandments of the Torah, of the law. And uh, in that particular year, the Rabbi of Lubavitch decided that his men should prevail upon the Jewish men to wear tefillin, the phylacteries, and women to light candles. So there was a mitzvah mobile, a great truck in front of Columbia University. And there was a Lubavitcher Hasid who would stop students, are you Jewish? If he, was, if he said yes, he would say, come and wear tefillin. So once he stopped also a beautiful student, are you Jewish? He said yes. He said, would you like some candles for the Sabbath? And she said, no, I would like to wear tefillin, phylacteries. <laughs> he said, but it's against the, the law. She said, what do you mean against the law? Uh, don't, doesn't your teachers tell you and us that we live now in the beginning of the messianic era and when the messiah will come all these laws will be abolished and therefore i want to wear tefillin and he didn't know what to say so she left him you know with her superb uh, air of having defeated a man a male chauvinist <laughs> after a few minutes he ran after her and he said lady i, I only realized that actually I, I should admire you you believe so much in the messiah Tell me, when is he coming? And she said, he, she.
Of course, this is the ultimate reconciliation between not only between those of us who wait and the person who is waiting for us to wait for the person, the Messiah, but it's also between he and she, us and them. Actually, messianism means reconciliation. When past and future fuse into one, when language and silence become one, when melody is universal and all of us belong to the same group of people who believe in the same meaning of the same words. How does the prophet say when the when Messiah will come, he will, he will bring the fathers closer to the children. Another prophet says, oh, when the Messiah will come, what will he do? He will simply bring closer those who are distant. But the main idea is to bring together people who until then were apart. There is one city in the world which I love, which all of us love, which precisely has tried to attain that goal, bringing people together, and that city is Jerusalem. How can one speak about reconciliation and not mention the city of reconciliation, the city of peace? It's called Yerushalayim, Ir Shalom, the city of peace, Jerusalem. Oh, I know that the city of peace has caused many wars. I know that the city has been destroyed 17 times in wars. And yet, there is something peaceful in that city. I cannot tell you enough how I love that city, to be there at night and listen to the muezzin at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, calling the prayers, calling the faithful to say the prayers. There is a peacefulness in the air. There is a color to the peace. And there is a meaning to every word and every sigh that you hear from one corner of the city to the other in Jerusalem. And yet, and yet, it belongs to all of us, and all of us want it, and one day all of us will have it. I thought for tonight, since it is a special evening, I was going to read to you something that I have written about and for Jerusalem long, long ago. But I will tell you a story how I have written it. It happened years ago, 20 years ago, when many of you students were not alive then, or not born yet. 1967. 1967, three weeks before the Six Day War, it began on May 15, the UN in New York listened to terrible speeches made by Arab representatives and their communist allies against Israel. They spoke against Israel via words that since 1945 were somehow outlawed, expelled from the vocabulary, and yet they were used then. And nobody stood up to tell them, you cannot say these words. You cannot threaten once more the Jewish people of extermination. You cannot. It's simply you cannot. There are certain things that cannot be done. Certain words cannot be said. Nobody said it. And day after day, therefore, we heard those speeches. I was then a journalist covering the United Nations. And I moved deeper and deeper into despair, for I thought it is finished. I do not believe that reconciliation is possible between the Jewish people and other people. Once again, we shall be abandoned. Once again, our solitude will be too much to bear. And therefore, I decided then, I was single, I was younger, that if and when the war breaks out, I will go there just to be there. And the war broke out. I went to 
it was difficult to find a plane. They stopped, the airlines stopped. The only one I think that still went was El Al from Paris. So I took a night flight from New York to Paris. In Paris, I caught the flight almost leaving. I was the last passenger just waiting for me to change planes. And as I entered the plane, the hostess was, uh, the stewardess was a very beautiful girl, or at least I was so tired, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and she gave me the seat next to the door and she smiled to me. And when the plane took off, she turned, she whispered, I know who you are. Usually I'm embarrassed when somebody says that because, you know, I work all my life to know who I am. <laughs> and she already knows, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But I was tired and she was pretty and they were going to war and I didn't say anything, I smiled. And from time to time she came back and she brought me everything, really. There were people in the plane who were more important than I. Yeah, there were wealthy people and generals going back and yet she treated me better. And really I thought uh, the Messiah has either come, either he has come already, <laughs> if I am treated like that, then the Messiah has come. Or that if not, then he deserves to come. <laughs> then at one point she came by and she need other people were already asleep. She whispered, you know, I know who you are, she said, and I love your book. By then I had already published six or seven books, so usually I would have been mean, I would have said which one, just to embarrass her. But I wasn't, I smiled and said, thank you. And she said, you know, I love your book. I really know it, I've read it three, four times. But there is one thing I don't understand in your fourth chapter, Mr. Schwarzbart. <laughs> I really became very modest. And I said, lady, I am so sorry, I am not André Schwarzbart. For those of you, I'm sure all of you know, André Schwarzbart is a very great writer who has written in 1960, he has written a book, 1959-60, uh, called The Last of the Just, which is a masterpiece. I said, I am not André Schwarzbart. She said, come on. <laughs> I said, lady, I am not André Schwarzbart. She said, listen, she said, I want you to know, I know here that you are incognito, but I know, so leave me. I said, lady, I'm not. <laughs> Couldn't prevail. So finally I give up and gave in. And I said, you know, I understand why you mistake me for my friend Andrei Schwarz, but number one, I'm also a writer. Number two, I'm also Jewish. Number three, he has written one book, I've written a few, but some of my books deal with the same theme, about the war. Number four, we have the same publisher in Paris. Number five, the same publisher in New York. Number six, there is a physical resemblance between us. Number seven, we are close friends. Number eight, it happened, it shouldn't have happened. That either in Paris or in New York, I don't remember exactly where, either the publisher published my picture on his book or his picture on mine. <laughs> and she said to me, you know, she said, Mr. Schwarzbach, <laughs> I am such an admirer of yours that I, I thought I knew everything about you. One thing I didn't know, I didn't know that you had a sense of humor. <laughs> what could I say? Uh, better go. Five minutes before landing, you know, tension increased in the plane, everybody had already the seat belts and lights out and tents coming to Israel and to war. I saw her come back to me and she still smiled but she was no longer pretty. She had a vicious smile on her face. She said, sir, all of a sudden I became sir. I don't know who you are, she said. I said, at last. <laughs> but one thing she says, I do know. I said, yes, I do know that you are not Andre Schwarzbach. <laughs> and the stupid person I was, I said, prove it. And she said, with pleasure, Andre Schwarzbach sits there. <laughs> <laughs> I jumped up to my seat. There was my good friend, my very close friend, Andre Schwarzbach. <laughs> we jumped, both of us, we embraced. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? And of course, we all, both of us came to bear witness. Both of us came to see how the people of Israel 
found reconciliation with its past and its history, with its eternal city, Jerusalem. So let me read to you just one or two pages of what I had then written. I remember I ran to Jerusalem, I came to the wall, and I began whispering with my lips to myself, my impressions, my ideas, my memories. And later on, all I had to do really was to transcribe the words that my lips had uttered silently. And then I heard a voice inside me saying, I am the eye that looks at the eye that is looking. I shall look so hard that I shall be blinded. So what? I shall sing. I shall sing with such force that I shall go mad. So what? I shall dream. I shall dream that I am David, son of Sarah, and I tell my mother what I have done with her tears and her prayers. I tell her what I have done with my years and my silences and my life. Why so late? I had no strength. I could not accept your absence, mother. If I have never written you, it is because I have never left you. You were the one who went away. And ever since I see you going away, I see nothing else. For years now you have been leaving me, vanishing into the distance, swallowed by the black and silent tide. But the sky that drowned the fire cannot drown you. You are the fire. You are the sky. And this hand which is writing is stretched toward you. And this vision which haunts me is my offering to you. And the silence, it is on your lips, I find it and give it back. Wandering beggar or prisoner, it is always your voice I seek to set free inside me. And each time I address myself to strangers, I am speaking to you. And so I contemplate the wall, the western wall, which bears my mother's face. Yes, she had two faces, my mother. One which we called the Wochedike of every day. And it showed the daily sorrows from Sunday to Friday. The other we called the Shabbosdike, which reflected the serenity of the Sabbath. And now, this is the only one she has left, the face of the Sabbath. And I see a human trunk pressing towards the wall, nestling against it. And so I stand aside and look. And in a flash, I see from one end of the world to the other and further into my deeper self. I see all those who had stood here before me, bent with humility or touched with ecstasy. Here before this very wall, kings and prophets, warriors and priests, poets and philosophers, rich and poor, all those who throughout the ages had pleaded everywhere for a little compassion, a little kindness, it was here they came to speak about compassion. Here in this place, a sage of Israel once remarked, the stones are not stones, they are souls. It is they who each day rebuild an invisible temple. Still, it is not here that I will find my mother's soul. The soul of my mother found shelter in fire and not in stone. And to think that her own dream had been to come here and pray and meditate and cry. So what? I shall dream in her place. But that army chaplain who is approaching, Torah in hand, like a bridegroom on his wedding day, where had I seen him before? Tears are streaming down his face as he recites a prayer and blows the shofar. And that old Hasid who comes running, where have I seen him before? Dressed in a black 
Captain and Black Felt had his prayer shawl under his arm. He hurls himself against the wall as if to smash his head. Hypnotized by the stones, he feels them, caresses them, and sobs inwardly without shedding a tear. For a moment, I observe him as if he were a stone among the stones. Then I see soldiers lifting him up, tossing him into the air, yelling, you must not weep, not anymore. The time for lamentations is over. We must rejoice, old man. We must cry our joy to the wall. It needs that joy, and so do we. And one circle is formed, then another. Everyone is dancing. And on a carpet of shoulders, the old man is dancing too. He is not afraid of falling or of flying away. He is not afraid of anything, and neither are we. Someone breaks into song, and that song fills the square the city and the whole country. Louder, louder, the old man shouts, bouncing back each time with new vigor, greater frenzy. He is in ecstasy, and so are we. Someone near me succumbs to tears. Someone is weeping, and it's not I. Someone is weeping, and it is I. And in my dream, through my tears, I see the old man lifts his arms, trying to tear away a scrap of sky, an offering to those who sing, to those who make him tall and proud and invincible. I know I ought to be afraid. The miracle is too violent, the joy too intense. It cannot last forever. But I also know that I am dreaming. I am at the top of a mountain. I trip over a pebble. I fall. I see the abyss growing darker as it approaches, darker than the dark eye of the tempest. I am afraid, but fear itself is part of the dream. The word that would describe best that moment was really reconciliation. At that moment, I felt that the Jewish people has found its most noble way of reconciling itself with its destiny, with its past, and therefore with its future. I felt then that we reconciled ourselves with the mountains of Judea, with the prophets who somehow still walk those mountains. I felt that we reconciled ourselves with the world, that we looked at the world and like God, we said, it is good. We applauded creation. We said, if this is possible, that means that human victories are possible. It means that victories must be human to be possible. And therefore, this reconciliation went beyond the present. It went beyond ourselves, for true reconciliation means reconciliation with oneself. Wars begin not with others, but with ourselves. Every war begins with words, and every word is born in mind. Wars begin here, in my mind, or in my heart, or in my soul. It is there that wars must be defeated and eliminated. And in other words, that means in education. We must educate in order to avoid any joy, any glory, any pleasure, any glorification of war in anyone's mind. And then there I felt it can be achieved, meaning we should be at peace with ourselves and we should celebrate peace, the one, the only one that permeates our whole being in ourselves. But above that, there is one more reconciliation which I think we have not examined yet, and we must now. Reconciliation with God. In the Jewish tradition, you should know there is always fear, the same fear. Since Prophet Ezekiel, Jeremiah, the Talmudic sages, we always had that fear. The fear of God being absent from history. Has God abandoned us? When we saw in the past how the Babylonians defeated Judah, Nebuchadnezzar defeated all the kings that we had, 
the King Hiskiyahu, the last one, when he heard what from the text what he did to Hiskiyahu, that he took him and he blinded him, but before blinding him, he killed all his children, so that he would take the images of his dead children as the last image imprinted in his memory. And we asked ourselves, how is it possible that the enemy is so powerful? Maybe it is that God has deserted us, that God has chosen a different dwelling place, no longer Jerusalem, but Babylon. And this anxiety, this anguish, is what dominated exile from the very beginning, the fear that maybe God is no longer with us. And therefore, whenever persecution has attained a paroxystic level, our fear has matched it in its intensity, in its violence. We were afraid of being abandoned by God. And therefore, I believe that there are moments, and in Jerusalem, this moment lasts more than a moment. There are moments when reconciliation with God is possible. That doesn't mean that we don't quarrel with him later. Oh, we do. I think it was Pascal, the great Christian poet and thinker who said that Jewish history is actually a love affair between the Jewish people and God. And as you know, every love affair has good moments and bad moments and we quarrel and we make up. We have quarreled so much with God and we made up so much with God. That doesn't mean that after reconciliation we won't quarrel again, we should quarrel. Whenever an injustice is being done, we should say, look, look, do something. However, reconciliation with God is part of reconciliation. There can be no reconciliation among people if there is not always also an attempt at least to reconcile ourselves with God. And how do we do that? There is only one way, and this is once more what we said earlier tonight. God is not absent from history. God is not a stranger to creation. God is, said the Rabbi of Kotsk, where he is allowed in. God dwells where we want him to dwell, where we are looking for a divine spark in the other person. That's where God is. And therefore, wherever people suffer, God suffers with them. And there are so many people who suffer that it cannot be that we should not think of God with compassion. And this is the next phase of reconciliation. Oh, we have problems. I must insist on that. When I think of the recent past, of the recent tragedy, God knows that I said certain things to him and about him. And I still do. I protest even now. But at the same time, from within the tradition and within faith, I think we must also speak of compassion for him. Look what we have done with his world. Look what we are doing with creation. We cannot say it's God's fault alone. We cannot say that Auschwitz is God's doing. I cannot absolve him either. But to say simply it's a theological question, nonsense. Auschwitz was not sent down from heaven into the earth. Human beings created it, erected it as a new monument to the 20th century. It's a human endeavor conceived by human beings against other human beings. So, of course, we must implicate both. And we must have compassion for God and compassion for those who believed in him and still do. For I must repeat, the tragedy of the believer is greater than the tragedy of the non-believer. What can be done, therefore, for any individual to reconcile himself or herself with God? Here we must make one more leap, and that is an essential one. We believe that the way to God leads 
to another fellow human being. If not, we make abstractions out of our fellow human beings. And in doing so, we humiliate both them and God, and that we shouldn't do. So therefore, it is I or you or any one of you who becomes that magic point of encounter between God and his creation. If that is possible, then we could look towards the 20th century as it ends, as it declines, as a threshold for another century where hope would not be extolled at such a terrifying price, where hope would be part of our quest for beauty and friendship and humanity. Is reconciliation possible? I am not sure it is, but what I do know is that we, all of us, must make it possible. Thank you. that all of you join me in thanking Ellie for what has been an extraordinary evening. Uh, I feel it was more a visit with you than a lecture and a reminder of both our vulnerabil vulnerability and our strength and our common humanity. Thank you very much. And now uh, Father Panuska will make an announcement or two. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you, Dr. Wiesel. You know, your, your message is inspiring and encourages us to continue the series with great enthusiasm. As I look at this broken fiddle, the gift of the Nogis a few years ago is symbolic of this series. I have to say, that broken fiddle is making wonderful music. Thank you. There <laughs> That's a reconciliation. There will be a reception on the third floor immediately following this lecture. And now I wish to make a special presentation. This is our centennial year at the university, and we're building many buildings, as you know, and uh, have many programs, and we're honoring people. To help honor persons who have helped us in our mission we have struck a very special centennial medallion, which reads, on one side, with the seal of the university and the symbols of this university, the Ignatian, the House of Loyola seal, the symbol of St. Thomas Aquinas, the Diocese of Scranton, the state of Pennsylvania, uh, religio mores, a cultura, our motto, and on the other side, simply, the University of Scranton, a second cornerstone, 1888-1988, engraved tonight, Ellie Wiesel. I would like you to know, Dr. Wiesel, that this, the first centennial medallion was presented in New Orleans uh, two months ago uh, to John Paul II. Let this be a sign of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. 